Hello everyone, my name is Jonathan Friedman. I'm a PhD student in Ben Gurion University. And today my talk centers on CXL memory as persistent memory for disaggregated HPC. This research was conducted in collaboration with Suprasad, Navneet, and Thomas from Intel under the supervision of Dr. Gal Oren from the Technion. And this collaboration is part of the One API Center of Excellence Initiative at the Technion. In this presentation, we will start by addressing the complexities associated with memory in HPC systems. So for example, we talk about trade-offs. We will also review the emergence of persistent memory hardware, obtained the CPMM, for example, and we talk about the inherent advantages and use cases of persistent memory for scientific computing. Following that, we will discuss the introduction of CXL memory and its potential to replace traditional persistent memory solutions, particularly now when we see primary products like Tain just phase out from the market. Then we include the practical implementation of a physical CXL memory on an FPGA device, and we showcase stream bandwidth benchmark results in both app direct and memory mode, providing a comprehensive discussion of the results. When we talk about memory, different aspects should be considered, such as latency, bandwidth, capacity, persistency, and utilization. When we talk about memory solutions, we actually talk about trade-offs. Latency and bandwidth, for example, affect memory performance, and we know high memory throughput is required to feed the CPU in data on demand. However, the rate of improvement in microprocessor performance far exceeds the rate of improvement in DRAM memory speed. This is known as the memory wall problem. It took a decade to introduce DDR5 after DDR4 with improvement of only 50% on bandwidth. However, today we see HBM, high bandwidth memory solutions, that are suggested to dramatically increase memory bandwidth, but these solutions are very, very limited in capacity. Obtain DCPMM was introduced in 2019 to offer large capacity of memory by delivering performance levels that are somehow comparable to DRAM. Obtain also offers persistency, which its main key feature. So it allows to configure fast byte addressable storage for applications. Now, when we talk about utilization, we know keeping memory close to the processor is advantageous for enhancing performance, but the tight coupling of memory and the absence of elasticity in the system can negatively impact the system's memory utilization. So why persistent memory is good for HPC? Persistent memory solutions emerge to close the gap between volatile memory and non-volatile devices. It combines features from both. It is byte addressable like DRAM, but persistent like storage devices. In terms of performance, persistent memory falls in between with capabilities approaching those of DRAM, often within a gap up to order of magnitude. Persistent memory also closed the gap in capacity and cost per gigabyte. Persistent memory modules typically offer two modes of configuration. The first is memory mode, where the memory functions as volatile memory, effectively expanding the primary memory of the node. The second mode is up direct mode, enabling persistent memory to be accessed directly by applications alongside the volatile, the volatile DRAM, that is the primary memory. And these characteristics of persistent memory prove to be highly advantageous for scientific applications with two direct use cases that require no or minimal changes to applications. When it comes to memory expansion, this type of memory enables the execution of large computational tasks on a single instance. Additionally, by serving as fast storage in app direct mode, Persistent memory plays a pivotal role in elevating the performance levels necessary for scientific computations, especially when we talk about diagnostics and fault tolerance algorithms. Persistent memory can be accessed via direct access file systems, 
or to be managed directly by applications using the PMDK programming model. PMDK stands for Persistent Memory Development Kit. Usually algorithm-based fault tolerance mechanisms can use PMDK to manually manage persistent data structures. So now let's shift our focus to Compute Express Link or CXL. As the HPC community continually explores new solutions, disaggregation appears to hold significant promise in the near future. CXL is new and groundbreaking high-speed CPU to device interconnect that's making waves in the world of this aggregated computing. CXL represents a significant advancement building upon the PCIe Express infrastructure while introducing innovative capabilities. It allows for a common memory space between the host system and connected devices, enabling a seamless unified memory architecture that facilitates data sharing and access. Furthermore, CXL ensures memory coherency, maintaining consistency and synchronization across memory locations. As an open standard, CXL has been adopted by a wide range of major vendors, resulting in extensive support for CXL in the upcoming memory and heterogeneous computing devices. Specifically, CXL supports memory disaggregation by facilitating the connection of memory devices also known as type 3 devices, and implementing the access by the CXL.mem protocol. The question that driving our work is whether CXL attached memory can serve as persistent memory and replace traditional solutions of tightly coupled persistent memory hardware. So considering both memory and updirect mode, and also in aspects of performance, in this work, we showcase that, yes, as we will soon showcase and present, the answer for this question actually supports the seamless transition in node architecture from what we know today, locally incorporating persistent memory, to embracing this aggregated CXL memory as a potential fair replacement. So how this concept works? CXL memory can easily be utilized as memory expansion as it implements shared memory space with the host and maintains memory coherency. It ends can be somehow treated like additional cache coherent NUMA node for the host. For the app direct access, CXL in version two supports not only DRAM memories, but also non-volatile products, NVRAM, non-volatile memory products, like Optane, with full support of the persistent memory programming model. The separation of memory from the host that the disaggregation gives us opens up the possibility of treating the remote volatile cards as persistent given certain conditions. For example, in terms of fault tolerance, if the host experiences a crash, the off-board CXL memory can remain accessible. But in order to safeguard the memory from its own power loss, it can also be equipped with a battery for added reliability. CXL memory enhances the traditional persistent memory solution in several ways. It offers greater scalability for memory expansion beyond onboard limitations. And additionally, this aggregation enhances the memory utilization of the system by allowing applications to allocate and access memory pools according to their needs. So this brings to the optimization of the resources in the system. Persistency can be achieved, as we said, through CXL non-volatile RAM devices or by enhancing the reliability of CXL attached remote DRAM. CXL also boosts the performance by enhancing system memory bandwidth through the utilization of multiple PCI Express links. To understand CXL performance as persistent memory, we now move to the experimental section. Our experimental CXL memory is realized using an Intel Agilex FPGA card, which supports X16 sized PCIe Gen 5 CXL connectivity which can provide up to 64 gigabyte per second theoretical bandwidth. 
the Artile Intel FPGA IP implements the CXL link and transaction layer management functions that needed to be implemented for the type one, type two, and type three endpoint designs. And specifically for type three devices, the memory devices, the CXL mem transaction layer receives the CXL mem requests issued from the CPU hosts and generates memory requests to the host managed device subsystem. So this FPGA card that hosts two of eight gigabyte onboard DDR4 memory is incorporated on our first setup. In this configuration, the host is a two socket SAPI Rapids processor equipped with a single 64 gigabyte DDR5 card for each. We also configure a second setup without CXL with two Intel Xeon Gold processors, each equipped with a single 16 gigabyte DDR4 card and consists of 10 cores. Each processor here consists of 10 cores. So back up to our first setup on Sapphire Rapids, we limit the number of available cores accordingly to 10 per socket via the BIOS. To assess the performance of CXL memory, we employed the stream bandwidth benchmark, which employs four fundamental operations, copy, scale, add, and trial. This benchmark provides a simplistic yet effective means of representing scientific computational patterns on arrays. The stream benchmark is parallelized using OpenMP threads across multiple compute cores. And we configured the array size to 100 million elements, resulting in a memory consumption of approximately 2.2 gigabytes for each execution. We utilized the stream PMEM benchmark to leverage the PMDK programming model, enabling us to allocate and perform stream operations on persistent memory. The original stream benchmark was employed to evaluate CXL memory in cache coherent memory mode, whereas we use the stream PMEM to benchmark stream operations in up direct mode. We have established two classes of configurations for benchmarking CXL memory in AppDirect and in memory mode. The first class utilizes stream PMEM to assess CXL memory performance in AppDirect mode, while the second class focuses on benchmarking the cache coherent memory access. Each class comprises distinct test configurations designed to evaluate the impact of both local and remote memory access on bandwidth. The first configuration for reference is the access of local DDR5 in AppDirect mode. Next, we configure remote memory in AppDirect mode. Initially, we access DDR5 on the alternate socket, which can be thought of as emulating remote persistent memory. Following that, we set up and updirect access to remote CXL attached DDR4 memory. And it's important to note that we distinguish between operations carried out by CPU zero cores and CPU one cores, since the FPGA is attached to the socket zero. So this is an asymmetric case. We also configure both CPUs to operate to simulate the performance of accessing memory from different hosts. We consider different thread affinity modes, close or spread. So this affects how the threads populate the CPU cores. So we start with accessing the memory in AppDirect mode, the memory in socket zero. Then we also consider accessing memory in socket one and also up direct access to the CXL memory from both processors. For class two, we configure remote memory in memory mode. We start with accessing memory on the opposite CPU socket. And here we consider both setups. So also with DDR4 and also with DDR5. Then we configure CXL memory in memory mode. So memory is presented to the host as another Numa node. No. 
then as we saw with the app direct configurations also in the cache coherent memory access we configure both cpus to operate to examine the effect of multiple hosts accessing the memory we now show results for the triad stream operation and we note that similar patterns were observed with the other operations as well. The graph presents memory bandwidth in gigabytes per second, according to the number of threads operating. So for the local app direct access to DDR5, memory throughput saturates around 23 gigabytes per second. And these are the results for the remote app direct access, a brief explanation of how to read the graph. So the colors indicate the operating CPU cores, red for CPU 0 and green for CPU 1. The symbols indicate the memory target, such as on node DDR4, on node DDR5, and CXL attached DDR4. The labels next to each trend denote memory location, PMM0 for socket 0, PMM1 for socket 1, and PMM2 for the CXL memory. So we observed that accessing remote DDR5 memory, which can be considered as emulating remote persistent memory, led to 25 to 30% decrease in throughput in comparison to the on-socket access. Furthermore, accessing remote CXL DDR4 memory in up direct mode decreased the performance in additional 50%. We also need to remember that DDR4 itself has 30% decreased bandwidth than DDR5 technology. And it's also worth to mention that these results for accessing CXL memory in a direct mode are much better than the known numbers of obtained DCPMM that significantly can be worse in performance than accessing your local DRAM, often by several factors or even up to order of magnitude. When both sockets are operating, we see that choosing close or spread thread affinity affects the results. However, when both sockets operate fully with the entire core count, the results converge for the on-node DDR5 and also for the remote CXL memory separately. And notably, accessing remote CXL memory, DDR4, leads to 57% degradation compared to the access of no, on node DDR5. And when it comes to remote cache coherent memory access, our initial observation is that performance is slightly better than accessing the same memory in up direct mode. This aligns with what we already know about the PMDK programming model, which introduces 10 to 15% overhead for managing the transactional operations on the persistent memory. We've noticed that accessing CXL attached DDR4 memory on the SAPI Rapid setup is faster than accessing DDR4 memory on the alternate socket on the Xeon Gold setup. While this might come as a surprise, it can largely be attributed to the presence of two DRAM cards on the FPGA, which significantly boosts the bandwidth. In contrast, on the on-node DDR4 memory, it, there is only one DDR4 card. These are the results for the remote memory access with both CPU in operation. The results indicate that when accessing on-node DDR4 using all available cores, it converges to a similar outcome as accessing DDR4 CXL memory with a slight advantage towards CXL memory. Furthermore, we can observe that accessing DDR5 and DDR4 on the two distinct setups that we made results in a performance difference of factor of two. And by that, we conclude the results for all the test configurations. So to conclude this study, in this work, we undertook a comprehensive exploration of the potential of CXL memory as a promising candidate for serving as a persistent memory solution in the context of these aggregated HPC systems. Using a state-of-the-art CXL prototype, 
we have provided empirical evidence that supports the feasibility of using CXL memory to exhibit all the characteristics we already had experience with. If, for example, when we used Obtain and we used the traditional persistent memory hardware. So uh, using CXL memory, we can exhibit all these characteristics that we know of persistent memory modules uh, while achieving impressive performance metrics. CXL demonstrates a modest decrease in performance compared to local memories while surpassing the known obtained performance. In our discussion, the fact that CXL memory device is DDR4 and not DDR5 is key, as usually PMEM is slower and cheaper than the main memory. That's the, the assumption that we make about persistent memory. By using DDR4 CXL memory and not DDR5, while the main memory is DDR5 in the setup with the CXL that we had with the Sapper Rapids, we keep on this important relation. For future work, there is a place for further investigation of the scalability of CXL-enabled memory in larger HPC clusters, that's first, and also Combining different memory technologies such as DDR, persistent memory, CXL, all this together in hybrid memory architecture could offer a balanced solution that leverages the strength of each technology. Moreover, extending the evaluation to real world HPC applications beyond these benchmarks can provide a clearer understanding of how CXL memory perform in practical scenarios. In addition, investigating fault tolerance mechanisms and data reliability in the context of CXL-enabled memory is crucial for large systems and can be further investigated. Thank you very much.